So now we come to God's Word. We are in this morning, John chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. Thank you, Brother Thomas, for that worshipful reading of Scripture. John chapter 5, verse 1 through 18. Last week, we saw in the passage preceding this, Jesus heal that official's son. Jesus displaying, putting, putting on display, manifesting his omnipotence. That is, that he is all-powerful. He displays his omnipotence by healing this official's son with a word spoken. You don't actually see a healing take place. You hear a healing take place. Jesus is not a doctor who needs to lay hands and scalpel onto the body or to give medicine. Jesus speaks a word and his word is powerful. This is why the book of Hebrews says he upholds all things by the word of his power. Jesus is the same one who spoke all things into existence where in Genesis 1 God said let there be light and there was light morning and evening the first day. And so Jesus puts on display the omnipotence of his word, his omnipotent power. And not only does he speak a word and heal the man, he knows specifically who this man is. His word does not just go out over all the earth and heal all people. His word specifically targets this one individual boy. And he shows mercy to this boy, and he heals this boy with his powerful, omnipotent word. Not only that, he heals him at a distance. He heals him at a distance, some 17 or 18 miles, showing that his power is imminent. His power is upon us. It's it's everywhere, because God is omnipresent. Jesus is omnipresent and omnipotent in the expressions of his power and his person. He truly is God in the flesh. Well, you would think if you have have someone show up, virgin born, healing people, feeding thousands at a time, performing miracles, signs, and wonders, and teaching wonderful, amazing things and expressing the grace and the mercy of God, you would think everybody would love Jesus. But not everybody loves Jesus. When Jesus came to this world in the incarnation, not everybody loved him then either. This morning in the passage that we're looking at, what we're going to see is two reasons the religious hated Jesus. Two reasons the religious hated Jesus. Indeed, there are many more reasons than this. But these, this passage contains these two reasons. And I'll tell you, these are, these are the same two reasons that religious people today hate Jesus. The same reasons today that religious people hate the biblical, true Jesus. So let's look at this passage this morning. And we'll summarize it by saying this, if you want to write it down. Being equal with God, Jesus carries out the work of God and possesses his full authority. That's why religious people hate Jesus. Being equal with God, Jesus carries out the work of God and possesses his full authority. The world hates Jesus. The world hates Jesus because he is equal with God. For Jesus to be equal with God means he is Lord over all. People do not want a Lord other than the reflection in the mirror. They don't like that Jesus is equal with God. So they want to dismiss that out of hand. They want to say that Jesus, yes, he was a historical figure, Jesus of Nazareth. And they want to say, and you know what? There was an uprising and a revolt, and they put him to death for it. They don't want to say that Jesus was carrying out the work of God. 
And that Jesus was not leading an uprising, but that Jesus was walking his own way to the cross to die for the sins of those who would kill him. People don't want to believe that Jesus was carrying out the work of God because to believe that, they're going to have to admit that they're sinful and that they need a Savior and that what Jesus did, he did for them. And they don't want Jesus to be their Savior because they don't want Jesus to be their Lord. Being equal with God, Jesus carries out the work of God and possesses his full authority. What Jesus does... He does in the authority of God. You know why? Because he is equal with God. Because he is God. He's not just a historical figure, though he is that. He is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh, equal with the Father, and possessing fully his authority. This is who we see when we see Jesus, and this is the reason why religious people hate him. This is the reason the religious people of Jesus' day hated him. It's an interesting event that takes place here in these 18 verses, really in the first 17 verses of John chapter 5. And it introduces to us somewhat of a new section in the Gospel of John. In the first four chapters of John, we are introduced to who Jesus is. We see that there is curiosity on the part of many people. Curiosity. We want to come. Nicodemus wants to come and have a conversation with Jesus. Disciples are coming to Jesus and they're asking him questions. And they're they're receiving teaching from him. They are curious. There are people going out into the Judean countryside, into the wilderness, to hear him preach. There are people going to hear John the Baptist preach about Jesus. Everybody is very curious, seemingly. But there's also a bit of hesitancy There's a bit of hesitancy. There's starting to be this rumble of threats coming out of Jerusalem from the Jewish leaders, the Jews. And so Jesus doesn't go back through Jerusalem. He goes around Samaria. When Nicodemus comes to Jesus, you sense the hesitancy in him already because he comes to Jesus by night. So in those first four chapters, We meet Jesus. John introduces it by this series of propositional truths in the first 18 verses of the first chapter. Then we see these actions, these events take place in Jesus' life, the turning of water into wine, the healing of this official son, the driving out of the money changers and the merchants from the temple. People are curious, but people are hesitant. In chapter 5 we see the scene turn entirely. And it goes from curiosity and hesitancy to a rapid rise in hostility. A rapid rise in hostility. In fact, that rise in hostility will escalate all the way to the culmination of the cross. And that hostility will be consummated when Jesus is crucified. And he's crucified for these accusations that are laid out in this passage this morning. So in John chapter 5, verse 1 through 18, we see that rise in hostility. And we see that that's the purpose of the recording of this passage, in fact. Jesus is going to heal a man. We're not told the man's name. We're not told the man's infirmity. Jesus actually heals the man, though in a public place, he heals the man privately, such that the man who is healed doesn't even know who healed him. And then Jesus evades all the crowd. Nobody knows it was him. You say, well, what's the purpose of this healing? Are we to see that Jesus is, he's sovereign over sickness? Sure, sure, that that is a point. But what's the purpose? The purpose is not the healing. The purpose is what precipitates from the healing. John makes this very apparent in verse 18. 
He's enumerating for us the reasons why people are wanting to kill Jesus now. It's not, not just for the healing, it's because of the occasion of the healing. That's why they want to kill Jesus. Look at the passage with me. You'll see it really in two sections. Verse 1 through the first part of verse 9, verse 9a. So verse 1 through 9a, there's the event. The event of the healing. And then in verse 9b, all the way through 18, you're going to read of the offense. The offense. The event is the healing. But the offense is intimately tied with the occasion of the healing. So let's be careful to identify that point, and we'll see what John is emphasizing for us. You remember John's purpose. It's evangelistic. So that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, we would have life in his name. John wants us to understand that Jesus is not crucified because he's a liar or a fraud or because he's lawless or because he's a blasphemer. He is crucified because he shows mercy on the Sabbath day. He's crucified because he preaches the truth that he is equal with God. He is not crucified for his sins because he has none. He's crucified because religious people got real mad because they don't want Jesus to be Lord. They want to rule their religious sphere is what they want. So let's look at the event real quick, verses 1 through 9. It says, now after this, there was a feast of the Jews. Interestingly enough, the purpose of John in recording this is not even tied to the feast. He doesn't even tell us which feast it was. It wasn't the Passover. There are three recorded Passovers in the Gospel of John wasn't the Passover, it most likely was not the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, would have been 49, 50 days after Passover. Well, most of the Jews would have stayed in Jerusalem for that time period so they could observe the Feast of Weeks. Jesus, on the other hand, he leaves Jerusalem, he goes to the Judean countryside, and then he goes around Jerusalem all the way to the north to Galilee. It seems more apparent that the feast is not the point. Maybe it was the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tents, the Feast of End Gathering. It celebrates the final harvest, the end of the year. And at that point, maybe Jesus now, in adherence to the law of Moses, he does as as the Lord commanded. And he appeared before the Lord in Jerusalem. So there's a feast in Jerusalem. Jesus is there abiding by the Mosaic Covenant, abiding by the law of God. But the feast is not the point. The healing is not the point. Look at the event, look at what takes place. Now there was a feast, after this was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there, was, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic or Hebrew that is called Bethesda. Bethesda. Now when you go to Jerusalem on the northeastern side of the city when, within the wall you come to a place called Bethesda the pool of Bethesda we were there we visited that it was right where if you got on Facebook and you scroll back a couple of years you would you would find a video of there of there of of myself and brother Eric and my wife Julia and we're singing in this little catholic uh, building called the church of St Anne's St. Anne's Church, and we're singing it. Well, that church is right by the Pool of Bethesda. There at the Pool of Bethesda, there are these, these roofed colonnades, these porches that would have protected people from the sun. You can see the ruins there even today on the northeastern corner of the city. It's called the Sheep Gate seemingly because that was the gate through which the sheep were brought into the city up to the temple. You remember, Brother Eric, when you're right there at the Pool of Bethesda, as soon as you start heading south, you go up the stairs and you're right there on the Temple Mount. You're right there on the platform that Herod built. And so they believed that the sheep gate was constructed to bring sacrifices into the temple, into the city. 
In Nehemiah chapter 3, you see that the sheep gate was the first part of the wall that was rebuilt. And when the wall was rebuilt right there at the sheep gate, it was priests who built that section. And it says that that section is the section that the priests consecrated to the Lord, which would make sense because it would be through that gate that they're bringing the animals there for sacrifice. They're already preparing. They're already preparing to renew worship to the Lord in the building of this sheep gate. But it says, the place is called Bethesda. This place called Bethesda. It's a pool. It's a pool. There, there is there a, a pool, an indention in the ground. You see it lined with bricks. And it's a pool called Bethesda. Now, the word in Aramaic is Bethzazda, means house of mercy, house of mercy. And so the belief in those days was that this pool possessed this miraculous water, or at times that this pool would become miraculous. This is a superstitious Jewish myth that people believe that when that water was stirred up, they could go and, and take a person with an infirmity and dip them in the pool, wash them, and that person would be healed miraculously. That pool is still there today. Some even believe that that pool contained red water because it was tinted from the minerals that got into the stream underground. Nonetheless, it is called the house of mercy. So you have all of these invalids, all these people with infirmities, with disabilities, and they would amass near this pool, underneath the porches, waiting for the water to be stirred so that the hopes they had in this myth could come to fruition. And maybe, just maybe, they could be healed. It says it has these five roofed colonnades. So underneath these is where the people would lay. Verse 3, it says, in these lay a multitude of invalids. That word for invalid uh, simply refers to a person who has a disability. And the three that are listed here, those truly are disabilities, the blind, lame, and paralyzed. Those who couldn't see, those whose legs didn't work, or maybe a limb didn't work, and those who just could not move at all. And this is where they would be amassed underneath these five porches. But it's interesting, and Brother Shane brought this up to me this morning, and already asked, he's reading ahead, and he asked me, he said, man, and he said, Brother Jordan, when I look at verse 3, I keep waiting for a 4 to come after it. But when you look, if you're reading in the English Standard Version, you see verse 3, and then you see verse 5. You don't see a verse 4. Is that a typo? Did, did somebody mess it? Because I'm telling you, if you mess up the numbering, Man, it starts getting tricky. Did they mess up the numbering? Did they just miss out and not put a verse that should be there? Now, if you are using a King James Version Bible, you do have a verse four in there. And you do read something in there, literal rendering of that would say this. It says, waiting for the moving of the water. So these invalids, they gather around the pool of Bethesda under the five colonnaded porches, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. Wow, never heard that in my life. I never read anything like that in the entire Old Testament that an angel of God healed somebody. The healings that took place were always God's power working through a prophet. It's not angels of God that touch people and heal them in the Old Testament. This would be something entirely new, something entirely different. So why is it that verse 4 is not there in the English Standard Version? Now, if you look, there should be a superscript teaching you how to read your Bible here. There should be a superscript for you at the end of verse 3. And that superscript will take you to a margin, and there should be a bit of an explanation. A more thorough explanation is this. The oldest and most reliable Greek manuscripts that we possess do not contain verse 4. The oldest and most reliable manuscripts we have do not contain verse 4. Note this in your head because this will come into play later on when we look at John chapter 8. 
So verse 4 is not contained in these oldest, most reliable. It's not contained in the Novum Testamentum. It's not contained in the Greek New Testament, the GNT. And when those texts were compiled from these manuscripts, these partial manuscripts that are gathered together, one of the things that these translators, these Bible translators will do is they will look at all of the oldest manuscripts and they'll lay them on top of each other and they'll compare. And if you have 15 manuscripts that say the same thing and the 16th manuscript contains an insertion that none of the other 15 do, they say it's very likely that's not original. It's very likely that that was added later. In the Greek New Testament, they actually note that verse 4 is omitted with an A rating, which means it's certain. It is certain that verse 4, this idea that an angel stirred the water and it's first come, first serve, dump your paralyzed into the water and they'll come swimming out. That, that, that's not there. It's not in the actual text. But the reason it seems that this scribe inserted this in the text that the King James Version uses is to explain what the man talks about in verse 7. Jesus says, you want to be healed? And he says, sir, I have no one to take me to the water and put me in when it's stirred. And we're sitting here questioning, going, what are you talking about? Well, it's helpful to understand that there was this Jewish myth, this Jewish belief that this healing was capricious, was fickle. It was undirected towards an individual that God would just pour out some mercy at some point and first come, first serve. God helps those who help themselves get to the water. And so this was the myth. And, and in fact, that myth is blasphemous. This is not the way that God conducts himself. God does not conduct himself willy-nilly. God does not just heal people without direction, without, without foreordaining it, without purpose. It's not first come, first serve. The last will be first with God. But this man has set his hopes not on God's word. This man has set his hopes on a myth. So these people are gathered here, and why do they set their hopes on myths? You know why? Because they're in a hopeless condition, and they're just going to grasp at anything they can. This is all they got? Just hoping the water gets stirred, hoping somebody gets healed, and I would ask them, why are there so many there if people are getting healed? It says, verse 5, one man was there who had been an invalid. He'd been disabled for 38 years. We're not told the infirmity of the man. Not told what's wrong with him other than the fact that he is disabled. For 38 years, perhaps that is the entirety of his life. Perhaps when he's a child, he falls and he becomes crippled from the waist down and he can't walk, can't move. That would explain why he can't get to the pool quick enough. But maybe that's just conjecture. 38 years. Whether that's his whole life or not, it's got to be the majority of his life got to be 38 years disabled that's suffering that's misery verse 6 when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that word actually translates as having known and having known that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, so Jesus has known that this man is there. Nobody needed to tell him 38 years. Jesus already knew. Jesus went to this man just as specifically and directly and purposefully as he did the Samaritan woman in Sychar. Jesus, having known that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Verse 7. The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one. How sad. Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. How sad. What a miserable state. The water starts rushing in from the spring, bubbling, getting everybody's hopes up falsely. And, and this man starts pushing off on his knuckles trying to get to the pool, and he just can never be there. 
And maybe he would sit by the side of the pool and just fall in as soon as the water comes bubbling up, but he'd sit there in the hot sun and he'd burn all day. What is he to do? He's got no one. No one cares enough for this man to actually take him to this mythical healing water. Nobody cares enough. So I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, he gives him three verbs, three imperatives. Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed. And he took up his bed and walked. Miraculous. You might be tempted to think, well, that's the point. Jesus healed the man. How did he heal him? He actually healed him the same way he healed the official son, with a word, with a command. He commanded the man to do something he had never been able to do in 38 years, and suddenly, because of the word of Jesus, the man has the ability to obey. So he, he gets up at once. He's healed, and he took up his bed and he walked, miraculous, amazing, incredible, private. There's invalids laying all over the place, an enormous crowd all over the place. And you would think that when Jesus says these three imperatives that everybody around him hears it, but they don't. You would think that all these people, they know this man, he's been laying there all this time, and surely they've struck up a conversation at some point. And surely when people see him pick up his mat and start walking off, people are going, what's going on? You didn't get to the water, and yet you're getting up and walking off. What's happened? It doesn't seem like anybody even notices that. It's a very private healing. It tells me that the purpose of the healing was not a public demonstration. It was not a public manifestation of the glory of God. Certainly, Jesus has done miracles and signs that do that. But this miracle, this sign, was not a public display of his glory as the Son of God. So why does John record this? Well, that's the event, the healing. The event is Jesus speaking word, healing this man. Now, in verse 9b, the second part of verse 9, through verse 17 you see the occasion. In fact, you see the occasion right there at the beginning of verse 9b. It says, now, that day was the Sabbath. A bit difficult to explain it, but the wording of the Greek there sets Sabbath as the emphatic point of that sentence. And that particle, that particle day is used for us to set off this entire sentence, to catch our attention. In fact, to emphasize that this was the Sabbath. This is the point that John's getting to. It's not the healing, it's the occasion of the healing. Now, that day was the Sabbath. It's a particle distinctive. It draws our attention to the occasion in which Jesus healed the man. And he heals him on the Sabbath. Well, what was the Sabbath day? Let me read a few passages for you from the Old Testament and explain. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, the first Sabbath day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God Shabbat. God Sabbathed. On it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. The Sabbath day, Shabbat, is built off of that, that God took a day and did no work. He completed his work of creation in six days, and on the seventh, he took a Sabbath, not to recover because of energy expended, but to rest because his work was completed. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11, you see the Sabbath day memorialized in perpetuity under the old covenant. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day, the day that God rested. Remember the Sabbath day, Shabbat, to keep it holy. 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord, your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. Nobody, nobody do work. Exodus 31, you actually see that if a person does work, they are to be put to death. Because the Sabbath day is set apart to observe God, to worship God. Verse 11 of Exodus 20, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested Shabbat on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So this is the issue. This is the issue. It's the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is a day of rest. The Sabbath day is a day of devotion. It is a day of rest from work and devotion to the Lord. All attention turned to the worship of God. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews, verse 10, and that's not a reference to the entirety of the Jewish people. This is a reference to the Jewish rulers. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, still not told the man's name. And they say, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. So you're breaking the law. You are violating the law. You're violating the Sabbath law because on the Sabbath day, you rest and you're carrying around a yoga mat. You've been laying on this pillow. You can't carry around a pillow and a blanket, your little pallet you had at the pool of Bethesda. You can't carry that around. You're working. What are you doing? Surely, as they had walked through the sheep gate, if they ever dared to go near the invalids, Surely they noticed this man. Surely they noticed someone who was down and out. But then again, Thomas, I don't know that they noticed the man. Because if they had, don't you think they would have been there to put him in the pool? Oh, they don't know this man. They have no idea that he was even healed. No idea that for 38 years he's been a crippled and now he's walking. They're worried about a pillow and a blankie. This man has just been healed miraculously. So it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. Now, was the man violating the Sabbath law? They said it's not lawful. They said it's not lawful. Exactly. They said it's not lawful. God's word didn't say it was unlawful. Is the man doing work? Is the man laboring for income by carrying around his blanket and pillow? No, not working at all. So what law is he violating according to Exodus 20 or Exodus 31? What law is he violating? He's not violating God's law. He's violating man's law. He is violating not even man's law. He's violating tradition. He's violating religious tradition. You see, you don't see a prohibition from carrying a bed. You don't see a prohibition from going from one place to another in the Bible. But you actually do read such a prohibition in rabbinic interpretation. See, the rabbis in Israel would take the Sabbath law and they would begin to interpret it and try to apply it. And they would say, well, it says you can't work, so what is work? So they make this long list of things you can't do. Legalists, this long list of things you can't do. 39 classes of work in the Mishnah. The Mishnah is rabbinic interpretation of the law of Moses. 39 classes of prohibited work. Not God's law. This is rabbinical interpretation or rabbinical application. And in fact, one of those 39 classes of work means that you cannot take something from one place to another. I kind of just think that's a way of saying, Simon says, freeze. Don't move. You're going to violate the Sabbath. Surely that is not what God intended when he gave the Sabbath. 
It's the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to take up your bed. Verse 11. But he answered them, the man who healed, he doesn't even know Jesus' name. He just says, the man, that one, the man who healed me, that man said, take up your bed and walk. So I just did it. He said, take up your bed and walk. So I got up and, wow, I got up. I'm not even thinking about carrying my bed. I could care less. Doesn't feel like a burden to me. Felt like a burden when I was laying on the concrete, burning in the sun, hoping to get dumped in the water. I feel light as a feather. I don't feel like I'm doing any work at all. Feel like I'm being carried along. No, I'm not carrying a burden. Well, the man who said to me, take up your bed and walk, hey, that's what he told me to do. Verse 12, they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Why? Why are they asking that? Because whoever said it is teaching him to violate their religious traditions. Who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Verse 13, now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place, a private healing, an anonymous healing. Verse 14, afterward, Jesus found him. That's not happenstance. The word actually implies that Jesus found him after looking for him. Jesus found him. Where does he find him? It says, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. Why? In the temple. You see, in the Bible, you don't see any prohibitions against invalids, the lame, the blind, the paralyzed, from being brought into the temple. You don't see any prohibitions. You see prohibitions against the priesthood, that if there is the, the lame or the blind, they are prohibited from serving in the priesthood. But otherwise, you don't see any prohibitions that the lame or the blind can't enter into the temple. But you know where you do see prohibitions? You see it in rabbinical interpretations. And in the rabbinical interpretations and traditions, guess what? No lame, no blind, no paralyzed in the temple. This man gets healed. Where's the first place he's going? He's going to the place that he was prohibited from going because of the religious people. He's going to go to meet with God. That's where he's going. He doesn't even know who healed him, but he's got an opportunity to worship. And you know where he's going, Brother Eric? He's going to church. Imagine that. You get an opportunity to worship. The doors are open. Nobody's stopping you. Go to church. What an example this man serves for us. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, verse 14, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. That troubles me. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. What's the implication of that statement? Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The implication of that statement is that his previous state of being an invalid was caused by sin. So don't sin anymore or else it's going to get a lot worse for you. Was this man's disability caused by sin? What I'm about to say might trouble you, but it's true. The answer is yes. All disabilities are. All disabilities are a consequence of sin. All of them. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all Sin. There were no disabilities before Genesis chapter 3. There are disabilities after the sin of man. So yes, this man was disabled as a consequence of sin. As a consequence of sin. Mark it in your mind. This man was disabled as a consequence of sin. Adam's sin, his forefather. His nation's sin. Secondly, 
Violation of the covenant. Violation of the old covenant resulted in the consequence of disability. Listen to this, Leviticus 26, 14 through 16. But if you will not listen to me and will not do these commandments, if you spurn my statutes and if your soul abhors my rules so that you will not do all my commandments but break my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will visit you with panic with wasting disease and fever that consume the eyes and make the heart ache, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. So the man's disability caused by Adam's sin, caused by national violation of the Mosaic covenant, but this man was also disabled for the glory of God. John chapter 9 Two through three, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. This man was paralyzed because of Adam's sin. He's paralyzed as a consequence of his nation deterring, leaving God and abandoning his covenant. This man was also an invalid for the glory of God so that Jesus could heal him, so that this passage could be recorded, so that this man could receive something. Again, what was the disability? The disability is a consequence of the sin of mankind. Note that in your mind. Listen to what is said. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Verse 15, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting, systematically coming after Jesus. Because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. He's doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working. He is laboring until now, and I am working. He says, the Father's working. You're over here worried about the Sabbath day. The Father is working. You just can't perceive that the Father is working. And while the Father is working, I'm doing the same thing. I am doing the works of the Father Pause because I thought that God ceased from working on the seventh day. His work of creation completed. Sabbath. And now Jesus says the Father is working up until now. And I am working. Well, Jesus is not saying that the Father is doing the work of creation, is he? Because he completed that. So what is the work that the Father is doing? not the work of creation, it's the work of redemption. And the Father is not Sabbathing from the work of redemption until it is complete. Jesus will not cease from his labor of redemption until his work is complete. You remember what Jesus said there in John chapter 4, verse 27. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That's my food, to do the will of him who sent me and accomplish his work. So then, the healing of this man on the Sabbath day, how was that carrying out the will of the Father, carrying out the work of the Father? Here's what it was. Again, why was the man suffering? The man was in misery as a consequence of sin. Jesus is carrying out the work of the Father by showing this man mercy. He showed the man mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is relieving someone from the consequence of sin. Relieving someone from the consequence of sin. Does this man deserve to be disabled? Yes, he does. The salient point is that all of us deserve to be disabled. All of us deserve death. All of us deserve hell. But God relieves us from the consequence of sin to a degree. This is what Jesus is doing for this man. 
He is not giving this man what he deserves. And the fact that you and I can walk on our own two legs, that is God relieving us from the consequence of sin. God showed mercy to Adam. In the day that you eat of the fruit, dying you will surely die. And God relieves Adam from the consequence of his sin. And he lets him live a life, though in suffering, all the way till an old age and death. So Jesus is relieving this man from suffering. He's showing him mercy. This is what the Lord declares of himself. Exodus 33, verse 18 through 23, Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. God says, that's my name. That is who I am. I relieve people from the consequences of their sin. I relieve people from the consequence and I show them grace. That is who I am. Jesus says, that's who I am. My father's working until now, and I am working also. Exodus 34, 6 through 7, the Lord passed before him, that is Moses, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children of the third and fourth generation. In Luke chapter 4, we won't read the entire passage, Jesus picks up the scroll there in Nazareth in the synagogue. He picks up the scroll of Isaiah, and he turns to Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 2, and he reads this. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Was this man oppressed? Surely. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to them, back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He says, this is, this is the work that the Father sent me to do, to set at liberty those who are captives, to free those who are oppressed. What have I done for this man who was oppressed with this disability? Set him free. Showed him mercy. Did the same thing the Father has been doing? I'm doing it now. But this is the reason why the Jews, verse 16, were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Jesus says, my father is working until now, and I am working. This is why, verse 18, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, was Jesus breaking the Sabbath? They say that he was. Was he breaking the Sabbath? Well, we've already talked about this. He's not breaking the Sabbath by showing mercy. He's not breaking the Sabbath by healing a man. He's violating their religious traditions. If your religious tradition prohibits you from showing mercy to people, your religious tradition might be demonic. Was he breaking the Sabbath? No. Listen to this. Listen to Jesus. I can't explain it better than Christ. Luke chapter 13, 10 through 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had, been, had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. Another word. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which to do work, in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath. What a demonic man. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? 
Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. He says, you hypocrites, you treat your livestock better than those who are disabled. Interestingly enough, our world treats animals, endangered animals, better than they treat babies, better than they treat people with Down syndrome. Just like it was demonic then, it's demonic now. This is the reason why the religious people hated Jesus. It's why they wanted to kill him. Reason number one, Jesus upholds the will and the word of God, not the religious traditions of men. That's why religious people hated him then. That's why they hate him now. You want to figure out a religious person who doesn't really love Jesus? Teach the Bible. They will identify themselves. Because Jesus, he's, he's just upholding the will of God and the word of God, but he does not affirm the traditions of men. He does not affirm the traditions of men. The Jewish leaders are not interested in a display of mercy. They are interested in the law. And you know what the law does not provide? The law does not provide mercy. The law does not provide mercy. The soul that sins will surely die. That's what the law of Moses says. The soul that sins will surely die. Aren't you thankful that God has not treated us according to the law, but he's treated us according to grace? Aren't you thankful that God showed mercy to us? Oh, I, I, I think it's highly appropriate that God in his, in his sovereign wisdom had the people name that pool by the sheep gate, Bethesda. It's a house of mercy, why? Because the son of God's gonna come there and he's gonna actually show mercy. It's not going to be indirect. It's not going to be mysterious. It's not going to come at the stirring of a mythical angel. No, it's going to come from the mouth of the Lord Jesus himself, the Lamb of God, who will march right through that gate up to the Temple Mount, and he'll give his life carrying a cross outside the city. He's going to show mercy. These people don't want mercy. They want law. They think they want law. Here's where religious people mess up. Religious people think they want law, but their rules betray them. They try to make rules to look good, try to look holy in front of people, but Jesus calls such whitewashed tombs. On the outside, they clean the dish, but inside they're full of filth. Just like a tomb, their insides are full of dead men's bones. That's what religion is. But God is gracious and slow to anger abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And he sends his son Jesus into the world to save sinners. So Jesus shows mercy. He doesn't violate the Sabbath. He actually makes this man able to experience a rest he never had by healing him. He didn't carry a burden. He lifted the man's burden off of him forever. You know what? Jesus didn't lift a finger to do it. He spoke a word. Spoke a word, burden's gone. So that's the first reason why religious people hated Jesus, and they still do. Reason number two, look back at verse 18. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Reason number two why religious people hated Jesus, because Jesus is the son of God, equal with the father in essence and authority. Religious people don't like that. Religious people, they want to be their own lords, making their own rules, looking good according to their own standards and their own judgments. They don't want Jesus to be Lord. They don't want Jesus to be God over them. And this is why they hated him, because Jesus is the Son of God, equal with the Father in essence and authority. 
Well, I've got a number of passages. You can see them in the notes that I posted earlier. Let me just refer to them real quick to save time, and I'll draw your attention to one passage. Write down John 5, 19. 5, 22 through 23. 5, 26. And then in chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus culminates it and says, I and the Father are one. We are one, equal with God. What's marvelous about the fact that Jesus is equal with God, right here in the flesh, equal with God. You know what Jesus doesn't do? He never uses his equality with God as a leverage for his own benefit. He uses his equality with God, his power, his perfection in pure worship to the Father. Listen to this, Philippians chapter two. Our great example, Philippians two, verse five through seven. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That word for grasped is, is the word harpagmas. It means to hold on to by force, to seize plunder. And he said that Jesus did not count his equality with God as an opportunity to benefit himself. He didn't use it that way. He could have healed this man, all the invalids, and struck down dead all the religious people and glorified himself in the moment, but he didn't do it. He didn't do it. He could have avoided the cross. He could have never had to rise from the dead. And he'd still be Lord over all. He'd still be equal with God. But this is what Jesus did. He didn't count equality with God a thing to leverage for his own advantage. Verse 7, but emptied himself. How? Did he lose something? No, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Subtraction by addition. He puts on humanity. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's why religious people don't love Jesus. Religious people don't love Jesus because they cannot grasp in their mind the idea of mercy because they don't think they need any. They think that they, they get what they deserve and they think they've earned God's approval. But the Bible teaches us very clearly all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God sent his son Jesus into the world to show mercy. And let me tell you, there's never a wrong time to do the right thing. Jesus comes doing the will of the Father, showing mercy to this man, not for his own praise, not for his own glory. The man didn't even know his name. He just lifted his burden, lifted his burden right there. Jesus himself, though equal, the Son of God, equal with the Father in essence and authority, what does he do for us? Shows us mercy. Shows us mercy by dying on our behalf, rising from the dead to relieve us from the consequence of our sin. And the consequence of our sin is not ultimately disability of the body. It's damnation in hell. Christ relieves us from that consequence and he gives us life. So let's go to him in prayer.